Hello everyone, my name is Curry Stegan, and I am the host of the Passion for the Paranormal podcast show. Thank you for tuning into the show on my YouTube channel, and please make sure you hit that subscribe button so you can check out other great content that's going to be coming down the road. Opinions and views expressed by the guests of Passion for the Paranormal are not always the views and opinions expressed by the host. Hello once again and welcome to Passion for the Paranormal, bringing a passion for the paranormal to you. I'm your host, Curry Stegan, and it's great to have you joining me on what should be another great show. My guest tonight has been studying the uh, strange and weird paranormal phenomena that's been going on along the Chestnut Ridge area. Uh, stretching from Pennsylvania all the way down into West Virginia and uh, there has been so much strange and weird reported phenomena going on in this area and he's been studying it for well over 50 years. He was also the uh, primary investigator of the Kecksburg UFO case so it's great to have him joining me on the show tonight. should be a great discussion. Uh, if you haven't already please head over to the Facebook page at facebook.com slash passion the number four the paranormal and please like the page, and uh, you can even offer a review on the page. That, that'd be great as well. If you're an iTunes user, I'd really appreciate it if you should, could subscribe to the show there. And uh, if you have time, please offer a quick review as well. That's going to help people find the show and keep it moving forward. If you're a Google Play user, you can also find the show there and subscribe there. And so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and get into the discussion with Stan Gordon. And I uh, really hope you enjoy tonight's show. Okay, so uh, I'm here with Stan Gordon, and Stan is a resident of Greensburg, Pennsylvania, and has had an interest in the paranormal since he was 10 years old. Stan began investigating UFOs and other strange phenomena in 1965, and was the uh, primary investigator of the famous December 1965 Kecksburg, Pennsylvania UFO incident. He has been a guest on many national and international radio shows, including the popular radio show Coast to Coast AM. And uh, he was also the producer of the award-winning 1998 video documentary Kecksburg, The Untold Story, and is the author of the books Really Mysterious Pennsylvania, Silent Invasion, The Pennsylvania UFO Bigfoot Casebook, and Astonishing Encounters, Pennsylvania's Unknown Creatures. In more recent years, he was on... The Close Encounter series on the Science Channel, Monsters and Mysteries in America on the Destination America Channel, Monumental Mysteries on the Travel Channel, In Search of Aliens on H2, and UFO Conspiracies on the Science Channel, and was also featured in the 2017 Seth Breedlove documentary Invasion on Chestnut Ridge. Stan, thank you so much for joining me on the show tonight. Thanks for having me on, Curry. Now, it, it's exciting to have you on the show. Uh, you know, and, and going back and kind of reading your resume, wow, over 50 years you've been investigating this stuff. Um, if you could kind of just, uh, to get us started here, if you can kind of just take us back to how you got started in all this and, and how you got involved in investigating all this weird and strange activity going on in the Chestnut Ridge area. Well, it was just a matter of circumstance. My birthday happened to be during the Halloween season, and back in 1959... Uh, as a birthday gift, my parents gave me a, an AM radio, and uh, that evening, I remember I spent listening uh, to the AM radio, tuning around the dial, and there were some radio shows, and they happened to be talking about unusual incidents because of Halloween. They're talking about flying saucers and ghosts and strange creatures, and I'm listening to the program, and I'm wondering, are these people making these stories up? Are they telling the truth? So I began to make a lot of frequent trips to my local a library in Greensburg and read all the books they had on UFOs and, and Bigfoot and anything unusual, and um, that's what started my interest. And um, I was 16 years old in 1965 when the incident happened near Kecksburg, PA, so it's about 12 miles from where I live in Greensburg. It's with a little community of Kecksburg in Westmoreland County, 
and I began to go out into the field to do first-hand investigation uh, after that incident, and I've been doing that ever since. And uh, 1969, I decided to set up a hotline for the public to report UFO sightings. Well, 1969, back then, there was a lot more ridicule of the subjects than there is today. And, of course, there was no Internet. There was no cell phones. And um, so I began to make contact with the local news media and the police and told them what I was doing. And I was still pretty young. And uh, as I recall, a lot of them really didn't laugh too much. They took it pretty seriously. And as word got out about the research I was doing about my hotline, the phone in my house began ringing off the hook. And it was people calling in day and night reporting not only UFO sightings, but anything that was strange or unusual, people were calling in. So people were calling me about uh, strange sounds and strange footprints and strange creatures and, of course, UFOs and haunted houses and anything unusual, the calls were coming in. Well, it got to the point very quickly that I realized that this was a lot more than I could handle on my own. So it was my goal to establish a, a volunteer group, and uh, hopefully of specialists like scientists and engineers and research people, to go out to investigate these sightings very quickly once the call came in. So that's what I did. So in, in 1970, I founded the Westmore County UFO Study Group. That was the first of three volunteer groups I would uh, start and, and uh, have going over the years uh, across Pennsylvania. The first group started, again, in 1970. We started as a small group, and we moved into the Pittsburgh area. And I was even very surprised who I got involved. And I can tell you, the high percentage of people that worked with me back then as a volunteer, we all did this around our full-time jobs. Most of them did it anonymously because they are positions. So we had scientists and engineers from, for example, from a Westinghouse, from Gulf Research, from Alcoa. I had um, people with, from colleges and universities got involved in it. I had police officers. I had former military people. I had a lot of specialists. They were all volunteering their time to respond to these cases. And I had to set up to respond to cases 24 hours a day. And uh, that's what we did. And by 1973, we had expanded to cover the whole state of Pennsylvania. And... Um, Lots of reports were coming in all the time. So we were very, very busy. And um, to our surprise, we were beginning to get referrals from uh, not only just the news media, but even, the, for example, the state police and other departments. And uh, so we were very, very busy. And it's lucky that we were around because 1973, which we can get into, we had the biggest both UFO and Bigfoot outbreak in history that went on for months and months from 73 into summer 1974. And that's when we uncovered some of the very strange aspects about Bigfoot. And um, it, it's a very interesting thing. We could talk for hours just about 1973, which is what my Solid Invasion book focuses on. Uh, yeah, fascinating. So what I really, really find uh, the most fascinating about this area is uh, it, it kind of reminds me in terms of some of the accounts. I don't know if you've heard of Skinwalker Ranch here in Utah area. Um, we've had a lot of strange phenomena reported in this area as well. Um, Robert Bigelow had set up um, a study group there for all the strange kind of activity. And, and in some respects, it sounds like some of the accounts, um, just in terms of the fact that there's so many different kinds of phenomena going on whether it be ufos whether it be cryptids that sort of thing that's what i find so interesting the other guests i've had on the show either they're talking about ufos or they're talking about a haunted location or a few different haunted locations they've done research on with yours there's so many different types of of, of phenomena of of activity going on that's what's so fascinating to me what i mean I know you, I think you said on the documentary, the invasion documentary that I watched that, um, you know, you think you're kind of getting some theories down and then something else kind of throws that out of the water. Can you talk a little bit about that? Okay, I, I, it's, it's a little hard to hear you at times. I think I got which I think you asked me talking about theories about what we're dealing with. Yes, and, uh, you know, all of a sudden you, I think you mentioned on the documentary that then you have a strange situation that kind of throws one theory out of the water. Anything right now you're working with in terms of theories about what the heck may be going on here? Well, 
you know, I, I've got to go back to 1973. And actually, we, we saw a little bit of some interesting, unusual events since 1972. But it was 1973 when first we had this major UFO wave. It started actually January 1st, continued to the last day of the year. There were hundreds and hundreds of UFO reports coming in across the state of Pennsylvania. And once again, as I've said many times before, going back to the time I started, it's still the same today. Many UFO reports, and even in fact sometimes cryptids and other phenomena, a lot of the reports initially may sound unusual, you know, very fascinating, but when you take the time to properly investigate them, many are turned to be either natural or man-made origin. So there's a lot of things that you can rule out. And of course with UFOs, a lot of misidentifications of, for example, uh, bright planets and stars, occasionally reentry of space debris, uh, bright fireball meteors, and then now more recent years we're getting a lot of Chinese lantern, sky lantern launches, and we're getting drone reports. So there's a lot of things that can look very strange, but you can track a lot of it down. But there are many, many other instances that hundreds of cases over the years we cannot easily dismiss. And these are not lights in the sky. These are large structured craft. And that's what we are dealing with 1973 and many years since. So a lot of those cases were uh, not just your typical uh, disc-shaped objects. We get reports of big metallic cigar-shaped objects and rectangular objects. And in fact, in more recent years, we're getting an increased reports of very large, solid, rectangular, box-shaped objects that are being seen. But a lot of those cases in 73, these were objects who were not high in the sky, some, in fact, were very low to the ground. We had cases where these things were uh, following over top of cars. Sometimes there was uh, power outages when they were nearby, uh, hovering over roadways. We had incidents on the Pennsylvania Turnpike. We had landing reports where, in some cases, there was physical traces on the ground. And we had, uh, in some cases, we analyzed some of the materials. And so it, it was amazing what was happening. So all these UFO reports are going on. But then, summer of 1973, things uh, became even much more mysterious, much more interesting. And um, anyhow, that's when we had the biggest Bigfoot outbreak that ever happened before. And um, anyhow, uh, what started was, I, I got a call from a person who told me, you need to go out and talk to my relative. And uh, something happened to them, and this would been a rural area actually only a few miles from where I live outside of Greensburg. And um, this person that evening was July 31st of 73, and this person was uh, in their home, uh, in the bathroom shaving, because he always got up early for work. It was a warm night. He began to smell this funny rotten odor. And I uh, happened to turn around the bathroom, look at the window. The screen was in, but the window was open, and there's these two huge glowing red eyes staring at him. The window's eight feet off the ground. And the guy ran into the room, started yelling, and some of the other relatives came out, and they smelled the odor, whatever was there was gone. And when I got the call on it, uh, the fellow, after the event happened, we ended up going to the hospital. And um, anyhow, when he got in out a week later, I went out to interview him that day. And he was still uh, pretty shook up over what had taken place, gave me a lot of detail. I found out that several weeks before, some of the, the local kids, they were taking a shortcut to what was in the old Green Gate Mall, not too far away, and they were taking a walk through some of the brush, and they heard this noise in there, and they thought it was a deer. So they began throwing some rocks in there to scare out the deer, and to their surprise, this seven, seven, eight-foot-tall, hairy, man-like creature with long arms ran across the road and up behind the house. So I was able to interview some of those boys, and I went up and looked around on the property, and I was up there for quite a while. I was about ready to give up for the day when I happened to look down. And up on the embankment, there was a, a two tracks. One was just a partial track. The other one was indeed the most unusual footprint I'd ever seen. It was 13 inches long and 8 inches wide, clearly three-toed. So I got on the radio, called one of my associates, and he came out. And we took measurements and photographs and made a casting. While we're out there, we get a radio call that that same morning, North of Pittsburgh, one of our investigators looked into an incident where something nine feet tall was looking into a structure, and the police have found these very large footprints up in that area. So this started this wave of Bigfoot activity that went on for months and months into 1974. And this was over a widespread area, over 
different counties, uh, multitudes of witnesses involved. And uh, again, back in those days, most people called the police. Again, there was nothing else. There was no internet back in those days, and they didn't have cell phones. And um, so it, it was an amazing time. And, and so many of these Bigfoot sightings were in daylight at very close range. We're talking 5, 10, 15 feet away from people at times where they walked out in front of vehicles, they walked near rural areas or mobile homes, and sometimes there was more than one creature seen together. And uh, in a lot of cases, we our teams would get out there within minutes to hours after the incident happened, and we would be able to document all this stuff and take photographs and measurements and take castings and footprints and other evidence we would gather. And um, it was amazing, the, the patterns and the details and what we were coming up with. And... You know, I had always felt from what I knew about Bigfoot, because Bigfoot wasn't new to Pennsylvania. I mean, the reports of Bigfoot went back to the Native Americans. I mean, there was newspaper accounts in the 1800s talking about this type of phenomena. And um, I had always felt up to that point that Bigfoot was probably an unknown animal, an unknown primate of some type. But some very, very strange details began to come to our attention that we were definitely not looking for. Uh, one of the things that, one of the first things that showed up is, you know, we'll go out to some of these locations and there'll be trails of footprints under different ground conditions, different types, times of the year. And in some of the instances, these footprints would just suddenly stop and vanish when there should have been more tracks around. We thought, you know, that's pretty unusual, like, what's going on here? Then we began to see patterns where, for example, we would have a UFO sighting in a particular area, and then... Minutes, hours, and days later, we would have a Bigfoot sighting or vice versa. And then the cases got even more unusual. Then we began to have cases where both Bigfoot and UFOs were seen together at the same time and place. And uh, some of these cases were just a very strange, very unusual, very well documented. And, de and then, again, I, I write about that in my Solomon Bayesian book and go into great detail about it. I mean, one of the, one of the cases was... Uh, September 27th up in Beaver County, there were two young girls waiting uh, to, for a friend to pick them up, and they see this huge hairy Bigfoot creature with white hair. Now, you don't generally hear a lot about the white ones, but people do report them on occasion, and it's running across the road towards the woods, but in one of its hands, they had a glowing ball of light. As soon after, this object came across the sky, projected a beam of light down into the woods where the creature had run into. We thought that was pretty interesting. And then it got even stranger and stranger with other reports coming in. And uh, anyhow, and, and again, we can go over some of those reports. We want to go into more detail about it. But uh, I had always, again, I had always thought that Bigfoot was probably some type of unknown primate. But then as these cases are unfolding and some even stranger incidents began to come to our attention, there were some incidents that began to make us scratch our head and began to make us wonder if we might be dealing with something other than a flesh and blood creature, which is why there's never been any bodies. And as reluctant as I, I am to say it, and I said this quite often on a lot of radio shows, some of the information we've been getting since that time and on and off and still getting, and I'm aware of this from not only Pennsylvania, but throughout the country around the world, from other researchers and other incidents that are going on, that we might be dealing with something that may be interdimensional, that we're dealing with a phenomena that apparently under certain conditions that whatever these things are we're dealing with, they come into our physical reality, they can look physically solid at times, they can leave evidence, and then they're gone. They come and they go. And, um, again, you know, I, I wrote about this 40 years ago. And back then, I, even though it wasn't a lot of ridicule, a lot of people didn't really pay much attention because you didn't hear much about it. But in more recent years, from the information I'm getting from many researchers throughout the country, more and more of them who used to laugh at this theory, are now taking a lot more seriously because they're beginning to ask the same question. If Bigfoot's out there and they're seeing something similar not only around the country but around the world, why don't we have a body by now? It just doesn't make any sense. Right, and uh, I had uh, a few months ago, I had uh, Bigfoot researcher Michael Johnson. He is the, uh, he is the founder of uh, Sasquatch Investigations of the Rockies, and it's interesting because we had that discussion and uh, it seems like there's one of two camps. Either some of the investigators believe that these are primates. We just have not, um, you know, we still have not discovered a body. Their argument is 
there's other species out there that we've went thousands of years until we ever found any physical evidence. But this is interesting now in some of your cases, I'm curious, uh, did, did some of the witnesses actually report seeing the Bigfoot type creatures kind of vanish in, in plain sight? Because I know the, there have yeah. been reports of that in the past as well. Yeah, well, probably the most, the, probably it was the case I'll tell you about now, that was the one that convinced myself and my, some of my team members that there's a lot more to this than we understand. And this is not the only case. And, and there are cases all around the country and other parts of the world that, again, are similar. But you don't hear about them that much, even though I'd say in the last few years, if you go on the, in the Internet, there's a lot of different websites that talk about some of this now. But anyhow, it was an incident that happened February 6, 1974, up in Fayette County. And you'll probably hear me talking more about Fayette County. It's one of the most active areas in the country for Bigfoot sightings and other cryptids and UFO reports year after year. It's been like this historically. Going back historically, in fact, uh, it was up in Fayette County, near Indian had it, where I have the, the earliest account of a Bigfoot sighting where I interviewed a witness going back to 1931. And, uh, but the case that I'm, I'm referring to was February 6, 1974. Some of your listeners probably will recall the time period. At the time, there was a big national trucker strike going on around the country. There was some violence going on on the roadways around the United States, and there was gas rationing going on. So I couldn't get up to the sea until the next morning because I couldn't get any gas in the area. And um, what happened was, this was deep in the mountains up the Ohio pile, which, by the way, is an area where there's continuous more reports of Bigfoot in that general area almost year after year. And um, what happened was, this woman was uh, in her little cabin home. She had lived in the mountains all her life. She was very familiar with animals, and she was a good shot. And she pretty much wasn't afraid of much of anything. So she's sitting there watching TV as normal, and she heard this commotion on her little porch. She had some, she had some pop cans out there, some empty pop cans, and someone was knocking the pop cans around. And um, previous to that, there, were, there was a pack of wild dogs running through the area. So she thought, well, those dogs are probably back. I'll just grab my shotgun, and I'll fire over her head, and I'll scare them dogs away. So that's what she did. She grabbed her shotgun and loaded one chamber. And she walked over to the wall and turned on the, the switch for the outside porch light. She walked to the front door. She opened up the door and stepped out on the porch. And there's no dog, but only a few feet in front of her is this huge, hairy, Bigfoot-type creature with its arms straight up over its head. And as many times I interviewed her, she never ever called it a Bigfoot. She said to me, it looked like a great, big, hairy ape. So what does she, when she sees this thing, what does she do? She fires right into it with her shotgun. She said there was this bright glass of light, a bright flash of light, like a flash on a camera, and this huge hairy creature physically disappears right in front of her. Now, the interesting part of the story is her, her in-laws live about 100 feet away, and they heard a gunshot. Called her trying try to find out what was going on. She tried to tell him. So her son-in-law grabs his sidearm, and he starts running down the dark road towards her cabin, and he sees a figure in the dark running down the road, and as he got closer, indicated surrounded by four or five hairy people with eyes like coals of fire. It started shooting at him, ran into the home, and around that same time period, there's this large object, like a big Christmas ornament with lights on it, hovering over the woods at the same time. That's when they called the state police. Now, I, I interviewed the uh, primary investigator, and um, it was interesting because at that time period, because all the violence on the roadway, both the National Guard and the state police were patrolling together. So both some National Guards and state police responded to this incident. They told me, but I was told by the time they got up to the scene and found the place, whatever was going on, whatever there was gone, however, the, the trooper told me, he said, I know what happened up here, something very, very strange was going on. Now, he based that on the animal reactions. Now, I'm not sure if I mentioned this to you in the beginning, but in the 59 years I've been doing this research, it'll be 59 years later this year, I have never personally seen a Bigfoot or UFO myself. I've seen a lot of evidence. I've interviewed hundreds of Bigfoot witnesses and thousands of UFO witnesses. I've never seen one. I've seen a lot of evidence of the office field that we've gathered. And um, anyhow, uh, so again, 
you know, it, it was a very, very interesting case. And what I did see was how the animals reacted in some cases. And we were about to some of the locations soon after the incident. While horses and cattle and other animals quite often appear to be very frightened and do, do not have their normal patterns that they do uh, when these creatures are close by, but it's very common when these creatures are very close to even the most vicious dogs. Even the most vicious dogs, in many, many cases, are almost like completely paralyzed in fear. They don't bark, uh, they, they shake, they cower, they hide, they don't make any sound at all. That's something you just can't fabricate. And um, that's something I have seen myself. Wow, that... And um, I remember the trooper told me, he said there was one, they had, I know, several big dogs. And it was completely quiet when they got on the scene. When I got there the next morning, I mean, it was back to normal. One of them was in a cage, and that officer opened that cage up. That dog wouldn't move. Like you said, that dog should have ripped his arm off. That didn't even move. And uh, that, that's very significant, I think, for some of these type of reports. Well, wow, that's that's interesting. So on the uh, on the documentary the invasion on Chestnut Ridge, there was the story of the uh, the farmer that um, seen these two creatures. Are we talking about the same case, or is this actually a separate case? That's a completely different case. Um, the case you're talking about is pro is the case uh, associating a Bigfoot and UFO. It was even though we were getting other cases earlier uh, in around October and um, in those months around the time in '73, it was a particular case that occurred in Fayette County again outside of the town of Uniontown. That it was the incident that convinced my team and I that there was a lot more to the Bigfoot phenomena that any of us could have ever imagined. It's much, much stranger. None of us had the answers as to what's going on. And, and as I tell you some of the story, I'm just going to give you the brief part of it. We could talk for hours about this case, and it's one of the strangest cases ever documented. There's no doubt about it. But um, I am not suggesting that Bigfoot is an alien riding around in a spaceship for another planet, because we don't know what we're dealing with. We, right. we know there's a lot of things out there we do not have an explanation for. And there's a lot of theories out there, but nobody knows for sure what we're dealing with. I said years ago, we, there may well be more than one origin to the unknown category for the UFO phenomena. You know, it could be that a small percentage of these are extraterrestrial, but could some of these things be again? Could it be interdimensional? Could it be time travelers? Could it be unknown natural phenomena? You just don't know. But anyhow, the incident I'm talking about, again, happened on October 25th of 73. I got a call from a state trooper from the Uniontown Barracks, and he had just come back from investigating this incident. And he felt that there was a good chance that something was still up on the farmers, up in the pasture, and he asked to send my team up as soon as possible because he thought, again, something might still be there. So it was late at night, 1030, when I got the call, and we got our team together, we got our, our equipment together, and we headed up to Fayette County, and it took a while to get there, and we didn't know the exact area, but we found our way there. And um, what we found out was about nine, I believe it was about nine o'clock that night, to about 15 people in this uh, rural area, they see this object, it's about as big as a barn. It's a big, round, red sphere. And it's only about 100 feet off the ground, and it's slowly moving downward. And uh, a number of people are standing outside looking at this thing. Um, the farmer's son, who owned the property, the, the father owned the property, the farmer's son was coming out to visit his dad. And as he's driving down through there, he sees people standing outside looking at this thing coming down. So he decided to go up uh, at a higher location to get a better look at this thing at a neighbor's house. And um, it looks like this thing is going to land in his dad's pasture. So there were two young boys up there, and they decide, all three of them, they're going to go up in the field and see what this thing is. So they stop over at his dad's farm, and they grab, he grabs a 30 odd 6 and some ammunition. In that ammunition, he didn't know it at first, but there was uh, two tracers. So, again, when, for the hunters out there, they're good for memorial trace. You just get that luminous trail. And um, anyhow... As uh, he told me at the time, as they're driving down the farm road, close to the pasture, the dogs in the distance are just going crazy. They hear this high-pitched whiny noise, and they hear this, uh, these baby crying sounds that are getting louder and louder. So they, they angle the truck, actually, 
because of the what the headlights on, so they can get an idea, or rather be able to see a little better going up the hill. And it looks like something's straining the power from the headlights. They've never noticed that before. And um, as they finally get up to the top of the hill where the pasture is, they're standing there in amazement. About 250 feet away, this object is now on the ground or right above it. And they can't believe what they're seeing. But this thing now is not a complete sphere. It's like a half a sphere, like a big white dome, maybe 100 feet or so in diameter. It's illuminating in the whole area. It's making this loud whining noise. And they're just standing there in amazement. But the amazement with the object soon turns to something even more unusual when they notice about 75 feet away along this barbed wire fence are these two tall, hair-covered creatures walking upright in their direction, one behind the other. The one in the front's about eight feet tall. The one in the back, maybe about one behind, is about seven feet tall. These things are bipedal. They cover a long, dark, matted hair hanging down off the body. The arms are so long, they're almost down to the ground. So, of course, that eliminates the bear. And they're bipedal, they're walking upright. They have no neck. They have luminous, glowing green eyes. And they're making this baby crying, whining noise. And they're standing there, they, they can't believe what they're seeing. And the one kid says, so kid, he ran out of the field. The other kid student starts yelling, shoot him, shoot him. So the guy takes his first shot, which the first shot's a tracer. Nothing happens. He fires that second shot, which was the second tracer. And interestingly, something does happen. The largest of the two creatures lets out this loud, whining, crying sound and reaches out as though to grab at that tracer. And the moment it does it, the object in the field vanishes and disappears. Wow. It doesn't take off. It's just zip. It's gone. So all that, that loud, rolling noise, from almost all that luminosity, it's gone. At that point, the two creatures turn around, start walking along the barbed wire fence back towards the woods, where they came from. At that point, the guy's firing live ammo from his 30 odd six, mainly aiming at that, that largest creature. And he had no doubt he hit this thing, and he said he kept firing this thing. He told me, he said, I'll never forget how that huge creature with those glowing green eyes kept staring at me as I'm firing at it with my 30 odd six, and there's no effect on it whatsoever. Wow. So they ran back to the truck and went back to the farmhouse and brought the family, went to a prison and called the state police. And um, about 45 minutes later when the troopers showed up, and they went up there in the troop car looking for evidence. And again, this is the short part of the story. But the trooper told me over the area where the thing had been on the ground, the whole area was subluminescent and glowing, maybe around 100 feet or so in diameter. He told me, he said, the farm animals would not go into it. He shined his flashlight beam into it. You could barely see the beam. And it said if he had a newspaper... He could have read the newspaper from the glow coming off that area. And um, some other things did go on, and then they went back to the barracks. And then I was told both the trooper and the witness were both taken to two separate rooms, separately interviewed, and then they called me to send my team up. And then even stranger things happened throughout the night. And uh, like I said, it was the case that convinced us that this phenomenon is much more unusual much stranger than anybody has ever realized, and nobody has the answers as to what's going on. So uh, here you have two separate cases where the witnesses had fired at these creatures with no effect. Is that correct? You know what? I, I'm sorry, I couldn't understand what you're saying. It, the, the audio is not real clear. So uh, in these, so you just talked about the previous case as well. Where the I think I believe it was the woman that fired at the creature. So these are two separate cases where the witnesses had fired at these creatures with no effect. Yeah, there are those, those are two separate cases. But in the case with the woman up in Ohio pile, the creature physically disappeared, and that's not the only case like that. There are other cases as well. And again, we we still have reports over the years, even in in fresh heavy snows. And people are calling and reporting seeing a series of large, long tracks in deep snow, no other tracks around, and in some cases those tracks will suddenly stop and vanish when it should have been more tracks. So that's, that's just one aspect of it. Um, I have a whole lecture that I do uh, on all this really strange phenomenon up with Bigfoot. It's called uh, Strange Aspects of Elusive Bigfoot. 
and it gets into a great deal about uh, some of these other incidents, which suggests there's more to Bigfoot than just the flesh and blood explanation. Again, reluctant as I am to say it, and I keep an open mind to all possibilities, but uh, until we have a body, and I'm not sure from what I've seen over the years that we're going to find one, if this is what we're dealing with. And again, it, this is something that I, it's not just that I've uncovered in Pennsylvania, but I've talked to other researchers around the country since the 70s and, uh, and others from other parts of the world, and many of these other people are very familiar with these kind of reports. A lot of them know about them, but many of them have been reluctant to talk about or publish their findings because they don't want to be laughed at by their colleagues. My position is this is what we're finding. This is what we've been uncovering. I don't have the answers to what's going on, but I'm not going to sweep it under the rug and pretend it's not happening. But nobody knows what's going on out there. I said years ago, the phenomenon is so strange it protects itself. Yeah, that's that's just amazing, amazing accounts there. I wanted to spend just a little bit of time talking about the Kecksburg UFO case, if you don't mind. And, and you were the chief investigator for the Kecksburg case. Um, can you talk about how many eyewitnesses you actually interviewed w regarding that case over the years? Oh, my gosh, I, I've lost track. I mean, I know I've interviewed many hundreds of people, and it's really interesting because we just had the uh, the annual Kexburg UFO Festival in July of this year, and it was probably the biggest one they ever had. People by the thousands now come in from around the country for this local event. And it, it's interesting, uh, not only in Kexburg, but I, I do a lot of lecturing around the country and around this area on these subjects. There's a, a huge public interest in it of, of all age groups. And here in Western PA, especially in the greater Pittsburgh area, on occasion... I'll have an, an, an elderly person, maybe in the 70s or 80s, approach me, and they'll just tell me, just tell me the, the story of them saying, and, and not even thinking much about it, say, yeah, that thing that happened around Kexbury, I was there that night. And they go into great detail, tell me about who they were with and what happened that night and what they saw. And, you know, unfortunately, so many important witnesses and so many witnesses have passed away. A lot of other ones are up in age and their health is very bad. A lot of them are forgetting now a lot of their memory for what happened that time. But, you know, I interviewed all these people years ago and documented all the information, and I produced the, uh, the uh, Kexburg, the Untold Story documentary, which is great, great detail about what uh, happened in 1965. But there's, uh, there's people out there, and, and I'm convinced there's other people out there that have some really good information who have never come out, you know, forward. I mean, I know there's many other witnesses because relatives and neighbors and friends of people who were involved. You know, some of these people have told me things confidentially, so I know there's other people out there that have information. But uh, when it happened in 1965, and I can I'll give you a, run, a brief rundown on the story, I mean, after as this was breaking on the news of this huge fireball coming in from Canada, Ontario, um, from Ontario over Michigan, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, and multitudes of people were seeing this thing in the sky. And whatever the object was, it apparently fell into a wooded ravine um, about 40-some about miles southeast of Pittsburgh. And um, so there were multitudes of people saw it coming in. And some people, especially within miles of, of the impact site, I mean, some people said this thing was only a few hundred feet above them. They got a very good look at this thing. So depending on the angle, depending on where it was moving, some people got a really close look at this thing. And uh, other people saw it dropping from the sky down into the woods. So what we know is that whatever this thing was, it was apparently moving relatively slowly. It was, it was making change in direction along its trajectory. And it came down very slowly, almost like it was controlled. But nobody at this at the main scene reported seeing any parachutes. And what we didn't know at the time was that some of the local residents, soon after they saw it fall, they went down into the water ravine, and here's this large metallic object semi-buried in the ground. So this thing is shaped like a big metallic, kind of an off-gold bronze-colored-looking acorn, a big metallic acorn. It's about 10 to 12 feet or more in length, about 8 to 10 feet in diameter. It's one solid piece of metal on a raised up back like you'd have with the acorn on the surface. There were these unusual markings that witnesses said look more like symbols than writing. 
And luckily, one of the witnesses is only a few feet away from it because of his family background. He was familiar with uh, Russian or Cyrillic, and um, he said it was not Soviet markings. He said these were more like symbols. And he was so interested over the years just from his memory that he, he went to different libraries over a period of time and was looking up ancient writings, and he said, from his memory, the closest he could recall that what he saw looked similar to ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. So what we know, and again, making the story short, we could talk for days and days about what we uncovered about what happened out of the scene and how people interacted with the military on the scene. Because I tracked down not only the witnesses, but I found we had reporters there from all over the greater Pittsburgh area, from all the major radio, TV, and newspapers. They became part of the story because they either saw or interacted with the military themselves. And then I tracked down some military. And... Um, I tracked down some of the police who were at the scene, other authorities. Um, I interviewed some of the film crews or their TV um, people were using, of course, they used film back there uh, at the time. And um, so anyhow, there were so many people involved. And, um, you know, they all give you a great, a great account of what took place. And after so many years interviewed so many people, who don't, even today, the hundred central witnesses have never gone public. Most of them don't know each other. And they gave me such great detail and such little details. And some of those details for years I never made public. Some of them still today I haven't because they're trying to get confirmation of some other aspects of the case. And um, in the summer of 1990, before we did the Unsolved Mysteries TV show, uh, a man contacted me. We were able to check his credentials out. He told me he was a member of the Air Force Police, the Air Police. He said that they were made aware that this object had been recovered in Pennsylvania and was coming into Lockbourne Air Force Base near Columbus, Ohio. So numerous people late that night, actually early the next morning, saw this large military flatbed tractor trailer with an escort covering this large object with a tarp over it on the flatbed out of the area at a high rate of speed and apparently ended up at Lockport Air Force Base near Columbus, Ohio, during the early morning hours of December 10th. I was told they backed the truck and the object into a hangar, they set up a security perimeter around it, and they were given a shoot-to-kill order to anybody who approached that hangar without the proper clearance. And then I was told it didn't stay at the base that long, it continued on to Wright Patterson Air Force Base. And later I learned exactly what building they took it to, and it was not the infamous Hangar 18, it was another building on the base. Now, where's that today? We really don't know. So that's just a short part of the story. Interesting, isn't it true? And and I know I read this um, on the internet. And I know you don't believe everything you read on the internet, but one of the re, one of the articles I read was that NASA had came out from their investigation of the fragments and recovered, uh, stating that this was actually a Russian satellite or pieces of a Russian satellite that were came down that came down. Is that true to your knowledge? Okay, I I can just tell you since the time it happened. There have been many, many different theories on what the Kecksburg object was. Since the uh, 50th anniversary, um, and this was a few years ago, uh, I, I believe within, I, I can tell you since then, there's been at least three, and I believe now there's been a, a fourth new theory that has, has surfaced, plus all the other ones we've had over the years. There have been all kinds of theories, but one of the first theories we had, because there was something to go on, we, we thought that one of the possible culprits involved was a Soviet Venus probe called Cosmos 96. And the reason we're interested is because um, through our FOIA request and the information, we found out that Cosmos 96 had a technical malfunction. It was a, it was a Soviet Venus probe that did not complete its mission. Interestingly, it re-ended the Earth's atmosphere on the same date that this happened, but around 3.18 a.m. in the morning over Canada. This happened about 4.47 in the afternoon. So we always wondered if there was some connection. And without going into great technical details, whatever, in, in a lot more recent years, there's been a lot more information that's come out. And um, there was a big investigation done back, geez, about 2002, 2003. It was supported by the Sci-Fi Channel. And they were, they were supporting a group called the Coalition for Freedom of Information, Leslie Kane was um, directing, 
and they did a, a huge amount of studies or research on this case, and they were able to get in the area that I was unable to do and um, track down a lot more witnesses. But anyhow, to make the story short, Cosmos 96 has been pretty much ruled out uh, as the source for what happened. And um, you remember, it's 1965 when this happened. It was the early days of the space program. This thing was pretty, pretty large. Uh, it had no ribbons, no world marks, no seams on it. It was, it was moving relatively slowly. It was making change in direction. And this we got from a lot of different people from the information we got. And it made a slow descent without parachutes. And it was completely intact. I mean, you know, it was kind of a, it was a kind of a, a crash, a UFO landing. But it, yet it crashed through the trees and not trees over damaged trees. But the object itself was pretty much intact. Somebody buried it in the ground. And, um, you know, again, so many different theories out there. I mean, one of the theories more recent years a lot of people like is the Glock, the, the uh, Nazi bell, and it's an interesting theory, but I've seen no association between the two, I've, and I've never seen any well-documented information that the Nazi bell actually became a reality. Um, a lot of good theories out there, but theories are only so good, and we need to see the evidence. And again, there's a lot, there's a lot more to this story than a lot of people are aware of, and we don't have time even to get to get into it. But And there's a lot of details out there, and some details, again, that I haven't publicly talked about because I'm trying to get more confirmation on it still. But it, it's a fascinating account regardless of what this thing was, this object was. I keep an open mind to all possibilities, and um, maybe someday we'll, we'll have the definitive proof to find out what the thing actually was. Regardless of what it was, it is a very interesting story. And so many people were involved. And a lot of people are hoping that one day the government will tell us the truth about what they recovered so many years ago in 1965. Wow. Uh, is, is it true that there were a few people that reported seeing a some sort of body at the site? That's a long story, but no. Not a body, let's say a body on the ground, no. Um, there have been those, there's been rumors for years and years. I heard going back, oh my gosh, I've lost track of time, maybe 30 some years ago, I was hearing rumors that somebody supposedly had seen one or two bodies at the scene. I never found any evidence to support that. However, when I was filming my documentary, um, there was a witness. And actually, it, it goes back to when we did the Unsolved Mysteries TV show. And at that, after that show broke, there was a huge opening of new information. People from all over the country were contacting me about the case. So, so some of these were local people who had lived here in 1965 and moved away. I was getting anonymous tips. I was getting some very good information from a lot of sources from around the country. And this one fellow in particular, I'll, I'll, um, and anyhow, there was this one guy in particular, and... Uh, he contacted me, and he said, now that it's on TV, I guess I'm allowed to talk about it. And I said, well, what are you talking about? And he said, well, that thing goes on Unsolved Mysteries, and he told me a very, very detailed account. Um, how he was a truck driver, and he worked for a large supply house in Ohio, and how, within, a, as I recall, within a few days after the Kecksburg incident happened, a Navy officer came to their supply house and ordered a large amount of the special type of glazed engineering brick to be sent to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And um, so I found out more about the story. There was a second truck driver involved, and when, we, when he was contacted initially, he, he didn't deny it. He just wouldn't get involved. But later he changed his mind, and he did confirm the story. And what we found out was that he had taken the first load of the special brick at the Wright-Patterson, and uh, he had gotten there the day before the, the other truck driver did with him. So he had, the other guy got there the first day by himself. He saw the military fl uh, flatbed trailer with this object sitting outside this building with a tarp over it. The next day, when he and the other truck driver both went back with two loads of this brick down load, and they were told, do your job, unload the brick, don't be looking around, don't be getting curious. And... Um, when they got there the next day, the flatbed trailer was there with the with the tarp laying there, but the object was gone. So anyhow, as they're doing their job that day, the, 
the fellow who had called me, he told me that he was curious because he kept seeing these guys in like white coveralls with sidearms, and I believe like uh, there was rubber gloves, I think rubber boots, and they were periodically changing their outer clothing coming in and out of this building. So he was curious, and when he didn't see anybody around, he snuck into the entrance of the building, and up on scaffolding, he sees his, again, this big metallic acorn-shaped object with a strange hieroglyphic markings on it. Up on the scaffolding, there's ladders going up to it. There's men apparently trying to get inside of this thing or examine this thing. And apparently at one point, he began to ask some questions, and they must have thought at first he had clearance to be there, then they realized he didn't. And they basically told him, forget about everything you've seen, or we're going to throw you in jail and throw away the key. But in 20 years, this will all be public knowledge. And of course, that never happened. Anyhow, when I went, went to film him from my documentary, that witness was not in very good health. You can see him. He was, um, he was on oxygen at the time. He's, he has passed away now several years ago. And um, he said, there's something else I want to tell you that I didn't tell you at the time. And he said, I talked to my son the night before, and he said, why are you going to even bother to tell me? He said, because I may not be here, and I want him to know the whole story. And he went on to tell us that when he had snuck into that building and was not very well lit, uh, there was a, as I believe it was like a work table there, and there was a body, a small body, lying on the work table, covered over with a white sheet. He couldn't see any great detail. All he could see, as I recall, was the left hand hanging down, and he could see three fingers hanging down off the table, and he said the, the skin looked lizard-like. He said, that's all I could see. And I tried many, many times to get him to change his story, and he said, that's all I saw. And uh, so that was the first thing that was of interest. And, um, you know, there, there's another account which is very, very long and involved, but uh, there's another incident of somebody that that day when the object was down in the woods before the military came in and this other witness um, went down in the woods after hearing about this thing had been seen and he knew the air because he used to hunt down there and he went down he saw like this arcing light down on the woods which other people reported that afternoon and he came apparently across this object semi buried in the ground and he said he kept hiding because people began to come in he kept moving back into the woods deeper and deeper into the woods and um, he said he kept wrapping the branches around them. And he said, first he saw what apparently were some just the local people. And then he said, others began to come in. He believed they were probably some of the volunteer firemen. Soon after, military began to show up. He said he saw Army and Air Force. He had been in the military. He said, I know what they look like. These are Army and Air Force. And he also brought up something very interesting. Apparently there was one, and I believe more than one, but he said there was one person in particular that he was focusing on. And he said, I don't know if this person was a congressman or a senator. I said, what are you talking about? He said, yeah, he said, I, I couldn't understand, like, why would, they be, why would he be down in the woods? He was dressed like a congressman. He's dressed in a black suit with a fancy black hat. He has a black tie on. He has a camera. He's taking photographs of the object and the broken trees and something on the ground, taking all kind of pictures. And he seems to be the guy that's giving orders to the military. And... While he's watching, he had to keep moving back into the woods. He said an army officer jumped on top of the object. He had some kind of a long, thin metal rod. He used to sound like a policeman's billy club. And he said, I'm watching this guy, and all of a sudden, for whatever reason, he strikes the surface of this object. And he said moments later, and, and his whole demeanor changed. I mean, this guy's voice started quivering. And he said, I swear to God, sir, I swear to God there was something inside of that thing. And he said, at that moment, after he hit it, he said, uh, a hatch in the front of the object swung open from right to left. And he said, all I could see from my position, he said, it looked like a long, elastic arm. And he said, from where I was positioned, I could only see like two fingers. And he said, it was, he was like on the back of the, of the uh, hatch. And he said, there had to be another hand there, but I couldn't see it the way, the way I was positioned. And he said, I could hear it hit really hard, like metal on metal. And he said, the officer started screaming, hurry up, hurry up, we don't have much time. And then he went into great detail how these soldiers came over and started cleaning up around the object, how they put this metal strapping on it, how they had to winch it over to the flatbed, because you couldn't take the trucks right down to the sea because of the trees, they had to winch it over, and how they loaded it on the truck on the flatbed. And um, 
he gave a very, very interesting account. I've given their short version of it. And we we hear rumors that there's other people that may have knowledge about this as well. And, I mean, these two fellows never met each other, didn't know about each other, was years apart. And um, so it makes you wonder. You know, I mean, these these guys came across to me just from what was going on because they were both reluctant witnesses and um, very reluctant to talk about it. And, like, why would you make up such a story? And it makes you wonder, was it someone or something inside of the object? Wow, fascinating. Uh, I'd like to get back a little bit about the di- the discussion on the uh, cryptid activity that's been reported in Chestnut Ridge. You've talked a lot about the uh, Bigfoot-type creatures. Can you just touch real briefly on some of the other um, strange and unusual accounts of of other creatures that have been reported in the area? Oh, there's, there's uh, of course, the most common reports, of course, are, are Bigfoot sightings. We get reports of... Uh, Thunderbirds are these huge, generally dark brown or black birds, and we're talking wingspans like a small aircraft, maybe 10 over 20 foot wide. And, and again, just like with UFOs, it's very difficult to judge altitude and size. But in some of these cases, these huge creatures were very low to the ground or on the ground. For example, we had cases where they're on the road blocking the vehicles in front of them, and they had their wings spread out so they could see the end of the wingtips. And I remember one case, and actually a uh, neighboring West Virginia a number of years ago, where this huge bird was eating roadkill, and the guy had to hit his brakes, and he's standing, staring at this thing, and the creature's staring at him, and it's hopping from one leg to the other trying to get off the ground, and he's watching the dirt and the gravel rising up from the ground as it's flapping its wings. It was a two-lane highway. When he went back the next day, he measured it. It was 21 feet across. Wow. And um, so some of these cases are amazing. And so we get the Thunderbird reports, and we continue to get them almost every year from different areas. And some of these have been really amazing reports. And what's interesting, while some of them look like these huge oversized birds, some people are talking about these giant leathery bat-like creatures. Others reluctantly are telling me what they saw look prehistoric, like pterodactyl or pterotorns. And... Um, and, and you got so many, just like with Bigfoot, so many really credible people who have seen I, I, Several years ago, I interviewed a, a witness, and he had called me. He said, I was so reluctant to call you, like so many witnesses are. And he said, all my life, he said, birds have been what I, my hobbies, things I've done. I know birds. He said, I'm familiar with all of them. And he said, I went and reread all my bird books again for a few days before I even called you because I still couldn't believe what I saw. And he saw one of these huge flying creatures in daylight. And he said, when I first saw it, he said, I thought it was a, small, a Piper Cup coming in, still sort of flapping its wings. And that's something that's common with a lot of people. They think it's an airplane coming in until it begins to flap its wings. And um, so that's one of the myths. And then we get the Black Panther reports. And, of course, when you think of Black Panther, you think about black leopards, uh, black jaguars, animals not common in this part of the world, but people see them quite often. And another phenomena with Bigfoot that a lot of people aren't aware of, but Sometimes over the years, historically, when you have a Bigfoot outbreak in a certain area, at the same time, you'll get other cryptids showing up. So it's not uncommon, for example, to have Bigfoot sighting and Black Panther reports going on in the same area during the same time period. And there's been some historically some incidents with more than one cryptid, like Bigfoot would be seen accompanying another creature. That's something you don't hear about very often, but something that's happened as well. And... Um, and there's many, many other kind of creatures. Uh, we're getting all kind of, we've had these fluorescent-looking, uh, glowing creatures have been seen. Um, we have what's called a Butler Gargoyle uh, north of Pittsburgh a number of years ago. This uh, seven, eight-foot-tall, leathery, light-skinned creature, about eight feet tall, um, very muscular legs, uh, arms with, like, claws on it, and wings tucked into the side. And... Um, it just goes on and on and on. There are so many different creatures on. That's what I wrote about in my most recent book, Astonishing Encounters. And there's all kind of weird creature sightings in there. And I can tell you, in the last few years, some of the cryptid reports we're getting are even stranger than the strange, or things that we've never heard of before. And, uh, and there's so many people from widespread areas reporting these sightings. And I've always said the best witnesses are people who don't believe that these things can exist that have their own encounter. 
And a lot of these people, it, it's definitely a very life-changing experience for them. Wow. That's fascinating stuff. Now, you've also had if a report. If you go to my website, which is stangordon.info, uh, I just recently posted a, a really interesting recent multiple witness Bigfoot encounter, which took place uh, outside of Pittsburgh July 14th of this year. So it's a very detailed account where you had uh, multiple family members having a uh, a picnic, a, a birthday party picnic, and what happened during that evening when apparently they were cooking a lot of food and making a lot of noise, having a lot of fun, and this very large Bigfoot came within about 60 feet, and uh, apparently at least one of the people there got a really good look at this thing, but all the other people, they heard the sound there, they had me walking as it was moving, and it's a really interesting report, so people can go to my website, info, and they can look at a lot of the reports on there as well. And they can go there for update on reports and also like events I'll be speaking at uh, around Pennsylvania and other areas coming up. Okay, great. Just uh, want to touch real quick also on, uh, you've had some other reports on dogman-like creatures as well, is that correct? Well, the, yeah, the dogman, you're hearing more about these reports of, again, the something that has some similarities with some of the Bigfoot reports and that these things are bipedal, but at times get down on all fours. Uh, the face of one more wolf-like. Sometimes they have people who see them closely out, they can see large fang-like teeth. And again, as with, with some Bigfoot sightings, they have luminous glowing eyes. Um, and yes, we, we've heard some reports in Pennsylvania for the last few years. I've interviewed some people who said they've seen something like that. But if you go back, and, and I talk about this, uh, uh, over the years in my writings, uh, during that 1973 outbreak, you know, a lot of the Bigfoot sightings going on during that time, they were your so-called typical Bigfoot reports. But there was also some variations. Some were shorter, more muscular. Some were thinner. And then there were some that people saw extremely close range. I'm talking within feet. And they got a very good look at the facial features of this thing, and it was very similar. The face was a little more wolf-like, uh, prominent fang-like teeth, luminous glowing eyes, and, um, you know, so they didn't call them dogmen back in those days, but the, but the familiarization of, of what they looked like um, was similar. So these things may have been around for quite a while, and um, but for whatever reason, more recent years, people are talking about them, and now they've, they've come across that uh, name of dogman. Wow, fascinating stuff. So uh, just one more time for the listener, Stan. I know you're short on time, and, and we need to wrap up. Uh, if you could uh, once again cover the website where people can find more information about your work. Uh, can you can you repeat that one more time? Sure. My website is stangordon, G-O-R-D-O-N, dot info, I-N-F-O. Um, there's email addresses where they can reach me. The easiest one is P A. UFO at Comcast.net. Uh, there's other contact information on there. My books, uh, all my books are available at uh, Silent Invasion, the Pennsylvania UFO Bigfoot Case Book, uh, Strange and or Really Mysterious Pennsylvania, and uh, Astonishing Encounters of Pennsylvania's Unknown Creatures. All those books are available on Amazon.com or BarnesandNoble.com or at my website as well. Any more books or documentaries, anything that you have in the works? Yeah, I've, I've been getting a lot of calls to a lot of different things. I've been just jammed up there with just a lot of reports coming in. Uh, I will be involved in a new documentary. I don't know if they have, I, I don't believe it's been announced yet, so I'm going to let them go ahead and announce it first. Uh, I may be involved with some other films later this year. So we'll just have to keep watching my website and we'll see what turns up. Great. Hey, Stan, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show. Such a fascinating discussion. And uh, as you said, you could go on for hours about this discussion and uh, just just in, in just one uh, aspect of it. And uh, just such, such sounds like such an interesting place, uh, such uh, interesting activity. I can only imagine you probably, this place has probably become a, uh, a mecca for paranormal investigators to try and visit. Um, but again, I really appreciate you coming on the show and taking the time to talk with me. And uh, hopefully we'll follow the website and see how things are going. Hopefully down the road, maybe we can have you back on and talk with you again. All right, very good, Curry. Thanks for having me on. Thank you so much, Dan. You have a great night. Okay, so that's going to about do it for tonight's show. 
Once again, a big thanks to Stan Gordon for joining me on the show. That was an amazing discussion, and it was great to hear his insight into such strange and weird phenomena that's been reported for so many years along the Chestnut Ridge area, and also to get his insight into all the research he's done on the Kecksburg UFO case. So um, just great to have him on the show and have that discussion with him. Uh, Join me next month when Dean McMurray will be my guest. Dean McMurray is known as the military medium. He was featured on the show Beyond Reality Radio just in the last few months. Really excited to have him on the show. Should be another great show. Once again, thank you for joining me, and we'll look forward to next month's show. Have a good night.